something Protestant or, or being interested in things about them, uh, Protestant moments, Protestant themes. Uh, there are um, two other things um, that I think um, Italian parts of it. I wonder if the people who are taking the class could write down uh, in uh, whatever form it is in their minds by next Monday. Therefore, it, it's just asking for the state of affairs next Monday. What you're seeing is your paper topic. I, of course, have my notes, and some of you have been emailing me, so I know where you're... But just, I'd like to know where you are next Monday. And a bibliography, which does not yet have to be an extensive bibliography, but just what you're thinking of doing in a little bit more formal way than, than you told me before, and then I can interact uh, uh, with you on that. And uh, we're just welcoming a guest today, from another guest from Art History, who's working on... Now here. Hi. Yes. Oh, what is your name again? Erin Campbell. Erin Campbell, who's working on old age in the early modern period, and with our other... Uh, colleague who was right there who was working on, on cartography and mapping <laughs> both I guess at the thesis stage or almost finished thesis stage no starting starting in one case almost finished in, almost finished in the other um, two um, last thoughts about Robley before we turn to this really wonderful set of readings for today one is just a comment I think we had a very fruitful discussion started off really by Suzanne's query about the marvelous and the monstrous and how that played. And we debated that back and forth. I'm not sure we mentioned the word savage last time. I don't think we did. I don't think we asked at any point what turns out to be or what already was important in Cartier and is central here, the question of what savage is and whether that idea plays at all in the, in the fourth book. I don't propose we discuss it now, but just that you might want to think a little bit about whether uh, whether that uh, all that play with animals and non-humans or part humans and so forth, whether that in fact was addressing the question of savagery, or whether it was just along a different axis in Cairo. But we'll just say put that on the you know on the back burner for today, unless it happens to come out in the course of discussion. And Daria wrote me an extremely interesting email, and I wondered if you'd want to just uh, share with the class a little bit of, about your thoughts, which we didn't, we had such a, you know, we, the class ended and we couldn't hear everyone's. Um, be, be, any, any specific ones? Or? Well, just, uh, I thought your comment about uh, parody, the ways in which you saw a parodic element or the inter an interplay between the ordinary well, the Cartier, for instance, and this, because we had talked about some of the divergences, but you had some interesting comments about parody that I thought maybe would be... Um, okay. I think I would well, we were talking about um, whether the Rabelais and the Cartier are in any way connected to the Cartier. Right. If they could any, any way have been a part of it. Um, and... Um, well, I had, I had a couple of, a couple of ideas going. One was um, just dealing with the fact that um, the second part, second book of uh, of the Rapoli begins with um, I don't know if I'm going to be but um, it was about um, I had a, I had a quote from there again, the point of view that um, the beginning of chapter two. I have you know, actually yeah, that day and the two point. following. They neither discovered land nor anything new. For they had formerly sailed that way, but on the fourth they made an island called Medamathy. Right. So, so you commented on so that. The, I, commented, I was commenting from the point of view that um, they were heading. Um, there was a, the audience that the, uh, that the reading is directed, that the text is directed at, seems to be waiting for some sort of uh, um, is expecting some sort of discovery to take place, and the reader, uh, the um, Rabelais himself, seems to be. Um, justifying it. He seems to be saying that uh, I don't want to protect what I wrote to you. <laughs> well, just exactly that. But in the car chay, you get there on the fourth day and then the discovery is spelled out. Right. And here we're waiting and <laughs> your, com your comment was that you don't you don't get what you what you want. Right. Uh, in pardon? In well, in Cartier, you get the, you get it. In the Rabelais, 
you, you're sort of led down this path as if you were going on a Cartier type trip and then you don't get <laughs> you don't get it you don't see anything for instance and, everything. and, and so there's a kind of I think, uh, you, you, don't, you don't remember all the interesting things you wrote me? No, I do. I just <laughs> Well, for, for example, that the first few days of that of, of the trip are described. Well, we're not going to not going to talk. Rebelly basically saying that he's not going to talk about specifically about the two pla first two places where they land because um, they've already been, and that's not interesting. But on the fourth day, they come across something new, and there's this mentality yeah. that the reader is waiting for something new to happen. Uh -huh. He's 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 anticipating that there has to be something new. Um, presented in a travel account. Uh -huh. You can't just be traveling and describing. There has to be a, an element of, of the uh, unknown. Um, and then once once they do make it, um, then the island is described, everything is described very um, ideally, very perfectly. And that's what I meant by the parody, just to yes. you that um, the crewmen are described almost as tourists on a cruise ship. As yeah. A, as a, um, and pretty much it's there's a fair, and they buy all their they buy all the things that they um, acquire. There's no sense of conquering, but it's 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 almost too simple. It's too yes. uh, and highly civilized. You commented right. too. Right. So, uh, but there I think there are a lot of points where one could play it off. I mean, you could play play off that the great fair scene against the uh, the tr the transactions, uh, the ex the gift ex the gift exchange, and and the car chain. Uh, anyway, this is an inter it's another interesting path. This idea of, of both a kind of parodic uh, uh, reflection, which would fit with Rob, one of one of Rob Lay's uh, ways of writing. The other thing that I was thinking of was um, in, in in the in the communication going on between the father and the son. I was thinking of Rob Crusoe, which, which we haven't discussed yet. Right. But there's the element that when Rob Crusoe leaves, he leaves and he's gone. And Rob Lay, you have the kitchen. This, yeah, this, this, this numerous communication going on between the two. Yeah. Um, the father and the son. And um, it's almost, it almost makes the voyage, I mean, it's it's almost mocking the voyage. It's not real. It's not, go, it, the goal isn't, um, isn't real. Completely depart. Yes, you can keep in touch with daddy back. <laughs> and he's going to come check up on you. <laughs> It's inevitable right after you. So I think there are a lot of really nice elements that, that uh, your, your comment, well, and we'll come back to that when we do um, the Defoe our, our last week. Well, let me um, uh, introduce you a little bit. I mean, you have a good, uh, those of you who read the, read the English, which of course you didn't need to, but, uh, but you have a very good translation, I think on the whole, very, very careful, and a fine introduction and notes. So in some ways I'll be picking up on things introduced to you by, by Janet Watley, but a few things I want to, to, to underscore. Uh, we have this uh, uh, young man uh, born in 1534 uh, who, in Burgundy, but is not part of the, not part of all of uh, Cartier's world of uh, sailors and Atla that Atlantic culture, but really right in the central in the wine country. Uh, a man who uh, had a conversion of experience, we don't quite know how, uh, to, to Protestantism, but in decades when many young people of what he seems to have been, artisanal background, uh, were turning to uh, Protestantism. He finds his way to Geneva uh, and uh, has uh, a, and again, this is, uh, the ones who wanted to sort of make do stayed in France. The ones who wanted to completely live according to the gospel, not have anything more to do with the mass, did find that did go to Geneva, uh, and and he uh, becomes part of uh, a training program for, for uh, these ministers, these Protestant new Protestant pastors. I must see a little unusual in coming from an artisanal background there. That there's some doubt about whether he that he was a shoemaker to begin with. Uh, and if you look at, as I have, at the social background of the men training to become pastors, uh, many of them are from the lesser nobility or commercial families. But there are a few artisans. But this is not unheard of. But, uh, and you can see, uh, though you're getting him in, in a book written in 1578, uh, in the final version, but you can see that there is a uh, classical culture of a kind with the constant reference to Pliny and a few other classical texts. 
and there's certainly a literary culture with the, the uh, Rabelais and the Marot. Marot is, a, is an important uh, uh, early 16th century poet who also is very important for Protestantism since he translated the, the Psalms into French. So, anyway, you can see that there's a man of some, some uh, wide culture and uh, travel accounts. You know, what he read by the time we went, we don't know. The 1550s, um, when this voyage uh, uh, occurs, uh, have a few characteristics that I think are quite important for understanding the story. First is, is it's at the height of the, uh, the public burnings of heretics, that sort of performance. We've got a lot of uh, performance, but we've got a certain amount of violent performance in this book. And this is uh, a few years before the wars of religion break out in 1562, where, where the society becomes in civil war, where the violence is war violence. Here it is this performance of, of uh, uh, big crowds watching these public executions and uh, Protestants, sometimes in great number, uh, being being burned, uh, usually singing the Psalms of, of David, the one that he sings in the forests of, uh, of uh, Brazil, uh, uh, among the Brazil wood, are being sung in the streets of, of Dijon and Paris and Lyon, everywhere, as these people are, are brought through, and then um, sometimes their tongues are cut out so they'll stop singing. <laughs> toward the end, but they're not supposed to cut them out too soon because they're hoping for a last minute conversion uh, and repentance so that the, there's a trade-off there whether they are allowed to sing or not allowed to sing. Uh, and uh, so that's this, um, this is a great period of public martyrdom uh, in France for those who have uh, on the one hand not gone to Geneva uh, uh, and on the other hand not decided to be Nicodemites, that is on the outside pretend to be Catholic but on the inside meet in secret conventicles and prepare for a day in which one day they would be open Protestant. So that's number one. This is just a political background. Uh, Nicolas Durand, uh, Ville Gagnon, the villain of the story of the history of a voyage to the land of Brazil, um, seems to have actually become Protestant for a time. Uh, the hypocrisy narrative that you get here uh, seems to have been really a, a, a change of heart and a change of mind as he began to see more about Catholic uh, and Protestant doctrine and its liturgical practice. But it, it also, the, the mid-1550s is just the period when uh, the French nobility, lesser and a few very high nobilities, as in the Coligny family, you will call that uh, Rabelais' 15... 52 book that we read last time, uh, the, the book four, was dedicated to the uncle of the man uh, to whom, oh no, yes, uh, to whom this book is dedicated. Another one of the great families that becomes Protestant, but a number of lesser nobles did just exactly in the mid 1550s. They join up, and this man, Durand, uh, who has been really part of a, a Catholic, uh, a world of Catholic military orders, um, uh, uh, a uh, uh, knight of St. John of Jerusalem, Chevalier de Malt, is one of the people that makes the jump and goes over to this new, into this new movement. And as you know from the, if you read the introduction here or, or the, the dedication, um, that having set up uh, a colony, a, a, a settlement, having established a settlement perhaps with some religious intent, but certainly with um, a concern for French policy and French competition with the Portuguese uh, in, outside of the Bay of what we call Rio de Janeiro. He then, as the story goes, if you read, calls, gets word to Calvin uh, that, that uh, they want uh, young ministers who will come and help set up a, 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 a settlement according to the true gospel and help convert um, the uh, indigenous the indigenous population, plus the other people that are on that boat. You notice the young boys who are going to learn the language and the girls who are going to provide wives for the uh, some of the local settlers. Uh, they only sent ten over, but still, they sent a few young women um, over. All right, so that's, that's our, our setting. I won't repeat all the detail, but you, you got it uh, from your, your reading. Uh, what we then have, all right, I'm assuming that, that uh, those of you who are new to this text, what happens is, uh, uh, after a very, very dramatic voyage uh, across the ocean, uh, they make it, uh, the three ships with the 
including these young men, of which are uh, Jean de Lary is one, being sent from Geneva with the young 15, 15 Protestant uh, uh, ministers, uh, they make it and they soon have a falling out with Ville Gagnon, just again to bring you up to date on this, in the, in the island settlement across from the mainland and uh, they are sure that uh, Ville Gagnon is, is, is abandoned the call of the reformed religion and they leave and while waiting for a, chi uh, a ship to take them back to France uh, uh, live in, uh, in, a, in a settlement and really right near the villages of the uh, Tupanama and then in fact live with them part of the time. So, all right, that's just, and then they get, again, for our visitor, uh, or those of you who haven't had a chance to read this, uh, uh, a ship finally comes in January. We've, we've arrived in uh, March 57, uh, and the departure date is actually January. It's actually not a whole year, it's it early March. Uh, the end of October leaves um, the island, although these are traveling on the mainland, even while from the island. And then in ja early January 58, they leave. So it's really more like a 10 months, two months really particularly close to the, the two piece, uh, but still with the first eight months able to travel. And then again, for our visitor, there's an extraordinarily dramatic return uh, when uh, they have terrible weather, an incompetent crew, and they have a dreadful, dreadful famine on board, on board the boat. Just to finish up his life, his life history, again, you may know it from reading, he returns um, and eventually finds his way back to Geneva. In the Deserto text, it looks as though he immediately goes back to Geneva. I'm not so sure that, that that's the case. Uh, I'd have to check it out in the Geneva language. But at any rate, he, be, he does eventually get, he does go back. But he, the main thing he does is he becomes a, uh, a minister in France. There may have been a brief stay. I think if I was doing that chart, I would have put, I wouldn't have just put Geneva, I would have put Reform France, because he, he becomes part of the very active Reform movement in France, and becomes a pastor there during the wars of religion. Um, becomes part of a whole movement of, of transformation and regeneration. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this when I talk about the text itself. But uh, during a time in which major French cities are seized by Protestant uh, 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 faithful and and the mil and the military their military arm that is these gentry with their soldiers and cities are remade as Protestant cities. It's, it's a t I'm going to come back to this notion of a utopian moment. This is I mean there's already a slightly utopian moment in Calvin's Geneva and 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 especially I should have added this before especially in the Calvin's Geneva when he was doing his studies for the ministry in the early 50s just before he left. A uh, very, very dramatic set of events that have to do with the domination of the city, not thoroughly by Calvin and his men, and by the Calvinist consistory. And I, I come back to that in a moment when we talk about the text and the question of discipline. But in the 60s, he is part of, of a movement which ultimately fails in most Protestant cities. Most of them go back to Catholicism. But he's part of that, of remaking the society. Uh, um, uh, a movement which in its violent form, and which he may not have supported, uh, cleansed the churches of, of their statues by, by crowds, by mobs. Uh, but even if it didn't do it by mobs, did it legally, uh, took down the statues of the saints and so forth, uh, tried to establish a, uh, a society living according to the true gospel. And then, as I say, in many cases, uh, La Rochelle, certain cases are exceptions, state laws getting around the seacoast, uh, in Marguerite of uh, in Jean d'Albret's Marguerite of Navarre's daughter's kingdom, state Protestant, and he is part of again. He mentions this in his text. Uh, the Saint Bartholomew's Day Massacre. First seeing it in, in the town he was pastor in Chartres sur Loire, and then uh, fleeing to Sancerre, and being part of a very interesting post. Does everybody know what the Saint Bartholomew's Day Massacre is? Not, you know, I think of that as so central, but I guess already everybody's heard of that. Uh, but then becomes part of, a, of an event that is not fully described here. It is a, a rather unusual event in post St. Bartholomew's Day France among the Protestants. Most of the Protestants were stunned by what happened and either left in large numbers for Geneva, gave up on France, or reconverted to Catholicism, or just went underground, hope, like conversos or something. 
uh, or Murano, it just went underground, and hoping for better times. But Sancerre, in 74, actually had an uprising uh, against, the, uh, uh, against the Catholic monarchy, which ultimately lost. And the famine of Sancerre was part of a Protestant uprising, sort of late, uh, put me in a very unusual moment. And, and, uh, and he, uh, in, the, in the text which he writes in the history of Sancerre, we not only have a discussion of the famine and the evocation of the famine on board his boat and cannibalism uh, and so on, uh, in, in that, he refers to that Sancerre thing in 1574, but we also have him in this book uh, developing, responding to it in a very interesting way. One of my Princeton students actually did a senior thesis on this, so I'm very up to date on it right now. Actually developing a kind of legitimation for popular uprising, which um, given the extraordinary Calvinist doctrine of the time was practically unthinkable. That is, Calvinist said the only, the only circumstance under which you could have a legitimate uprising against king or magistracy, if it was led by the lesser magistrates themselves, uh, members of the Parliament of Paris, if any who happened to be Protestant, or local magistrates. Uh, and it was, un it was really quite unthinkable that you could have a popular city deciding in its middle echelons. And here you had not only something that was decided by the, the Protestant town council, but you had something that had a very, very strong, at least my student claimed that you could make, make this, and I think he was partly right. And the representation of this in the book that appeared a few years before this history. This comes out in 1578. Uh, a few years before, he's published the history of, of, of the Sancerre, the Sancerre story. He then does leave France. He then goes to Switzerland and is, is uh, maybe he would briefly have been in Geneva in the early 60s, but he then becomes part of the the, the reform world of Geneva and uh, ends his life as a pastor, not in Geneva itself, but in the Pays de Vaux in, in one of the smaller towns uh, in the early 17th century. And as Watley points out so nicely, writing and writing and rewriting, but this was a, a huge success. This book went into many, many editions, and he kept adding more things onto it uh, after the, uh, even the 1580 edition, there's more added, a more critique of Teve, uh, the Franciscan who had been there uh, after him uh, and uh, whose work has a lot going for it in some, even though he's only there for a couple months, but who uh, simply lied about, misrepresented the Protestant uh, episode uh, in, in Brazil. So he expands and expands in these multiple editions, which would be interesting to read. If anybody wa wants to do a paper, anybody who's still uncertain about a paper, on on this te on any aspect of this text, or this text and Lady Strauss, or this text and uh, um, De Certeau, that you know that's fine. You, know, you don't have to have a brand new something brand new. It would be, might be a lot of fun to to do uh, or make Alfred Maitre, but maybe maybe a Chiste Trois would be the fun thing to do. So anyway, that's just a little bit of historical background. Then um, let me go through a few issues as I see them in the text before. You you know, we have a more general discussion. Uh, he represents the, uh, the voyage as one for religion, double, i.e. a safe settlement for Protestants, and it looks even more safe because he's writing in 78, six years after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, so that what he already thought in the 50s, 1550s at the time of the martyrdoms, uh, is at least as strong in the late 1570s. And some hope for conversion, so it's a double religious thing. Settlement, why if Villegagnon hadn't betrayed us, 10,000 Frenchmen would be living here, Francais, Frenchmen would be living here, and we would have a firm encampment rather than what happened with Villegagnon's betraying, this, uh, betraying us to the Portuguese. So that instead of the Portuguese there, we would be there. So there's that, um, but uh, he quickly, you quickly uh, moved to other kinds of actions in this text. Uh, it's not a travel account. It is after you, you have the opening chapters, which are, we came over, what we did when we first, our trip, what we first saw, then all those analytical chapters, which in which stories about things that he did along the way are just woven into events uh, that uh, uh, are part of his analytic, his descriptive scheme, and then finally you return to chronology again with the, with the departure. Uh, uh, let's see, the 
and yes, you, you have the vocabulary seen before the departure. Uh, so there's several other things happening. Let's just remind ourselves, and here we're just pulling things that all of us, I'm sure, have been thinking that have read this. We have uh, a text which is constantly uh, uh, critiquing uh, Catholicism in France, and Ville Gagnon as the, the uh, turncoat, uh, first and foremost, but Teve as the wrong reporter, but Teve is being uh, critique, criticized not only as somebody who's giving a wrong story, but specifically a wrong story that benefits the Catholics. Uh, it also doesn't tell the truth. Well, in addition, it doesn't tell the truth about, makes mistakes about the Tupis, but it also is, is, is telling a, a pro-Catholic story. And then along the way, an interesting critique of atheists, with quote marks around it. And you may we wonder what they are doing here. If you, if, if you happen to have read the book that I mentioned in an early remarks, uh, Lucien Febvre's uh, The Problem of Unbelief, the uh, problem de l'incroyance, so says him, yeah. you remember his strong claim that the word atheist is a very, uh, empty, in a way, empty one. It doesn't have a precise meaning. It means Epicureans, uh, heterodox people, uh, an odd assortment, not necessarily people who have the kinds of ideas of atheism that you get in the 17th century. Uh, or believe or have unusual ideas about the origin of ideas of Christ. Actually, when you when you read uh, Delary, he seems to be talking about people who deny a supernatural. He does seem to be talking about a more 18th century style of atheists, people who deny that there is a transcendent, a deity of any kind, and a creator, and want, and want to have totally natural notions. Uh, and it could, I was trying to think of, of uh, uh, if we could actually locate uh, the, the atheist that he had in mind, uh, he it could be it could be that he is con misnaming uh, some of the heterodox, heterodox people who were hanging around Geneva, the, the libertines as they were called, the spiritual libertines as they were called, or libertines in the early 1550s, and who were uh, put out of business at least as, as powerful influences by Calvin's successes in the 1550s and by Calvin's simply taking over theologically Geneva and establishing a kind of moral discipline. He could be thinking of some of these people, he could be thinking of some of the radicals that were in Lyon in the 1550s, 1560s, who were in fact not atheists, they were Unitarian, who denied the divinity of Christ. But at any rate, it's a little unclear, but he also wants to make an argument against them uh, 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 along the way, although he's Catholic. There's the critique of Europe. Um, and uh, made through, uh, that goes beyond the question of religion. Uh, that whether he's talking about family life or the lack of concern for property to, to uh, pass on to children, uh, he will find, uh, uh, or cheerfulness or whatever, he will find ways, uh, other than in religion, to play off the two Bs uh, against the, the, the Europeans or the French. Uh, we have a pastoral mode, and I maybe later Wendy will want to comment because I know she's interested in utopias. Uh, not a utopia by any means. Of course, you don't have that, but you have a, oh, utopian moments in the text uh, this, uh, uh, that he can then use to. Uh, it has its, of course, its ethnographic dimension, which is uh, quite uh, quite central. Uh, all, along with the others, that is entwined, braided with the others. You have, I think, something that is not said sufficiently by either uh, uh, Watley or by de Certeau, as rich as I think their writings are. Uh, you have a personal story. It's just a story of a human being here, um, uh, quite apart from what we know biographically about him. Uh, there's a, a story of uh, not a I mean just just Protestant narratives in the 16th century, in the mid 16th century, are often conversion narratives, uh, uh, ego histoire, pers personal accounts, or the ones that you get in the Book of Martyrs, uh, Crepin's Book of Martyrs, which is a, a, a text that begins to be published with the first burnings in France. Uh, based on letters or eyewitness accounts of, of the martyrs. It's like Fox's Book of Martyrs, which some of you have sure read. Any of you read Crepin's? Do you 
we do not care. Well, it's 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 uh, one of the great publishing successes of, of the 16th century. Very important text, which actually begins with the medieval martyrs who, uh, who Calvin, uh, who, whom Calvin and his fellows placed as anticipators of their own of their own Protestant movement. But it's based on these these eyewitness accounts, and it has two elements. One is the conversion story. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, of a, a sinful youth of one kind or another, uh, or maybe just a simple uh, servant woman who doesn't have a sinful youth, but just doesn't know anything, and then becomes Protestant and does some dramatic thing, interrupts the preacher in the middle of preaching, uh, or decides to uh, go back to, to Geneva and get little Bibles and bring them into France and either give them away or sell them at, for, for very low price, something of that kind. And then there's the marketing part.